Welcome. Dignitaries, colleagues, students, and loved ones with us today and our loved ones who are with us in spirit. We welcome you to the inaugural white coat ceremony of the MSPAS class of 2003. My name is Dr. Mary Grohl and I am the chairperson for the De Department of Medical Science. On a cold morning in early January, the journey toward this revered medical right officially commenced. In the past 12 weeks, these 32 scholars have expeditiously adjusted to the rigor of medical education while building relationships, reflecting on patient narratives, learning to put IVs, experiencing their first OSCE with a standardized patient, and testing every Friday with the grit and resilience of academic Navy SEALs. The integrity, the ethics, the endurance, the leadership of this particular cohort is legendary. As my sons would uh, welcome the statement, the force is very strong in this cohort. They are natural healers with tender hearts who are transforming into confident and compassionate medical providers. We recognize that this transformation could not happen and will not happen without your support, your love, and your understanding. I am sure that your heart right now is overflowing with pride, as is mine. But today I'm going to ask you that we, as their supporters, as their mothers, as their fathers, as their sisters, their brothers, their partners, their friends, their cousins, their community, I'm going to ask that you take a vow on this sacred evening as well. May we at some point in this ceremony whisper a vow to these precious students that we will love them unconditionally, that we will pray for them continuously, and that we will be kind to them always. What they are doing is not easy, but it is good. As you may know, the white coat ceremony is a near universal practice to symbolically visualize the communication wherein students don the white coat that reflects our profession. Tonight, more importantly than the donning of this white coat, is the oath our students will take with us as their witnesses, as their community, as their supporters, that they agree to the professional values that we expect, to the ethical practice of this profession, and a dedication to the collective and individual accountability that medicine requires. During the ceremony tonight, you will have the privilege of meeting our three key dignitaries that sit up here. Dr. Abiodon Goki Perayola, Dr. Marcy J. Sweed, and Dr. Richard Salcido. Along with the Assistant Dean of Graduate Admissions, Wendy Puchaki, who is not able to be with us tonight, you are, will meet the founding fathers and mothers of this program that was designed to be exemplary, innovative, humanistic, relationship-based, centered and rooted in community, or as we like to call the mortar between the bricks. Our visionary mothers and fathers of this program cast a mission that our students would become, our diverse students would become competent, compassionate, communicative leaders 
and providers, lifelong learners committed to community service and the advancement of the PA profession. And tonight we celebrate our students who with the impassioned and wonderful teaching of our faculty and our staff have allowed this visionary dream of our founding mothers and fathers to take place. So, this, so with this, I will pivot now to introduce our provost and vice president of academic affairs, GP. Oh wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Thank you so much. Leadership and community are the first five pillars of excellence of our program. And this program would never have taken place without this gentleman who brought it to fruition. His leadership, his community focus, he is our provost, he is our leader. His steady hand and years of experience are responsible for the inspired instruction, care, and support of this college's over 165 faculty, over 5,000 students in 60 majors, 60 minors, 14 different graduate programs, and four different certificates. He provides a leadership that helps us to grow, mature, become better people, become better academicians. Under GP's watchful and loving eye, we have become healthier, kinder, wiser. His sacrificial sponsorship and confidence with us and his students is simply the, the secret sauce of North Central College. We welcome his blessing every August, and we work hard all year for him. GP received his BA in English with a German minor from the University of Ife in Nigeria, his doctorate in English language at the University of Michigan. He has over 41 years of inspired instruction and teaching in the university as a university administrator and professor. He served as the provost and vice president of academic affairs and professor of English at Queens University in Charlotte, North Carolina, Oderbein University in Ohio, and Georgia Southern University. He was the dean in the Evans School of Humanities at Berry College in Rome, Georgia, and the assistant, president, uh, assistant to the president at Illinois State University. He has authored more than 30 scholarly publications and books in the politics and sociology of language. Please join me in welcoming GP, our provost and vice president of, of academic affairs. Thank you very much, Mary. I don't think I deserve the, all the accolades, but uh, that was very gracious of you. And uh, on behalf of the leadership at North Central College, I offer my warm welcome to all of you, family members, and of course, again, our students uh, whom I had the honor and the privilege to welcome earlier in the year. It's truly a delight and a pleasure for me to welcome you, friends and family, to today's symbolic ritual which marks the advent of a significant stage in the life of our students on stage today. Our students, you have chosen to be practitioners of the healing arts. And so today, I will offer you what I hope will prove an inspirational thought from the Yoruba religious tradition of Nigeria and the African diaspora. And then I will also offer a short Yoruba prayer of affirmation wishing you success on your journey. In addition, I will look forward to being able to offer you a second, longer prayer of affirmation upon the conclusion of your program at your graduation in 2023. In offering the invocation, I shall mention Olodumare. That is the name of the creator in Yoruba religion. I will also mention the name of Orumila, Olodumare's chief assistant and the only one deity that was present at the creation of everything that was created by God. And Orumila uh, is also the one who presides over the sacred Yoruba divination system. I shall begin the word, with the words that the Babalawos, who are the traditional diviners and practitioners of holistic health, 
holistic medicine among the Yoruba invoke at the beginning of their healing sessions. I would say this in Yoruba, which is my native language, and then I would interpret in English. Oni riran le ran mi wa o, emi komo ran ra mi. A she do wo eni to ran mi wa. Oni riran le ran mi wa, emi komo ran ra mi o. A she do wo eni to ran mi wa. The message speaks to the need for humility because it says, I am but a messenger and you are but messengers, instruments, if you wish, in the hands of the one who has sent you into this world, the one and only creator. And so remember always that your knowledge, your skills, your words are but channels for the healing power of the love of the creator that manifests in myriad ways, including in the practice of modern medicine. Oni olu shongbogbo eleri ikmi loruko orunmila. Orunmila agboni regun baba ifa. Aki gbogun laju le orun da ara orunmila. Aki fagba merin di logo sile kashina. We praise the medicine of the forest that comes from the invisible realm of the immortals through Orumila, the witness to creation. We praise the 16 sacred principles of the creator. May that divine knowledge and wisdom guide your hearts, your minds, your thoughts, your words, and your hands as you seek to heal and comfort. Ashe, and so may it be. Thank you very much. Thank you, GP. The five pillars of our program, leadership, community. The next two of those five pillars are humanism and scholarship. Humanism and scholarship represent and embody the exemplary life's work of our Dean, Dr. Marcy J. Swede, who is the Dean of the, the School of Education and Health Science and Professor of Health Science. The depth and breadth of Dean Swede's research illustrates the unique tapestry of medicine wherein a perfect marriage aligns between the foundation of medical science and health society and professionalism. Dean Swede's contribution to the scientific foundations of medicine focused on the genetics of the cellular response of stress. Her contributions to the health, society, and professionalism include her advocacy and love to expand interprofessional education with a focus on relationship-centered care and narrative-based medicine. Let me say this, as a physician, I had heard of the work of Dean Swede as it relates to narrative-based medicine and how that narrative can increase collaboration between professions and empathy, which is so important to the practice of medicine. Dean Swede's accomplishments are deeply entwined in our programs mission, vision, goals, and our curriculum. Dean Swede, as a person, is an authentic, loving, and caring individual, an incredibly wise leader. She inclusively develops us as faculty with fairness, kindness, and holds us all to the highest standards of scientific rigor. Her effective leadership has brought great renown to this campus, and she's opened, along with GP, multiple health science programs, graduate and undergraduate, which include, but are not limited to, the Masters of Athletic Training, the Masters of Science in Physician Assistant Studies, the Bachelors of Science in Nutrition, soon to be Doctorate of Physical Therapy, the Masters of Science in Nursing and Nurse Practitioner, and oh, by the way, 
Did I forget to say she did this all in the past two years during a pandemic? Dr. Swede got her Bachelor's of Arts at Brandeis University, her PhD at Carnegie Mellon University, and she was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at the Washington University School of Medicine. I ask you to please join me in welcoming a quintessential scientist, a health educator, a transformative leader, and a trusted friend to faculty and staff alike, Dean Marcy Swede. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Grohl. Welcome students, faculty, and all of the special guests in this auditorium today. I would like to add my words of welcome to those of Drs. Grohl and Goke Periola. I have had the privilege to speak to this amazing group of students already multiple times in the past, at admissions events, on their very first day here at North Central, at their orientation, as a speaker in the narrative-based medicine class, and most recently at their first interprofessional education event. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk to you, the families and guests of these talented students. The inaugural class of the North Central College's Master's Program in Physician Assistant Studies is already an accomplished group by any measure, but you all know that already. What have they already accomplished as they stepped onto this campus. Well, as undergraduate students, they excelled in academically rigorous and challenging coursework. They engaged in hundreds of hours of professional work and hands-on experiences. They participated in a deeply holistic interview process to explore not only their academic preparedness for this program, but to ensure that they had the necessary disposition for this deeply human-centered work. And just in these first few weeks, your students have already begun learning the skills necessary to begin authentic therapeutic relationships and the scientific knowledge necessary to be effective clinicians. How impressed are we with this group of amazing individuals? Today they take this critical next step in front of their faculty, in front of their college, their families and loving supporters, and in front of each other, their peers. They are committing to do this work with professional integrity and with an openness to learn from their faculty and from one another and to contribute to the learning of the entire class. They are committing to respecting the story and life of each patient they encounter. The path they are on, of which today is such an important milestone, will lead them to be uniquely qualified practitioners and healers. How proud you all must be. So what might they need from you, their biggest supporters, as they walk this journey? They need an open ear to listen to both their successes and their struggles. They need reminders that they would not be here if we did not believe in their potential for success, and that getting here is already evidence of their success. They need direction from you to ask them to seek out help from their faculty and from, to seek out help from campus resources for support and mentorship should struggles and doubt appear. We can help them through that. And finally, they need from you encouragement to take care of themselves, to eat, to sleep, to exercise, and to find some time for recreation and fun. We are here to hold them up as whole people, not just as students. Okay, back to the students. One last thought. Look around this room. You are not alone. You have people who support you. You have faculty and administrators and friends of the program all on your side. You have a whole team standing with you as you begin this journey. So congratulations on this milestone, but please take a moment, look around, and breathe it all in. Congratulations.
Thank you, Dean Swede. Leadership, community, humanism, scholarship, and last, innovation. Innovation is the last of the five pillars of our program and most definitely represents the chairman of our advisory board and keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Sal Salcido. Dr. Sal is a seasoned professional and in truth a renaissance man whose sustained accomplishments have and continue to transform medical education, industry, and research. We have within our midst one of the greats of medicine. He is the Walter Erdman Professor Emeritus of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. Dr. Salcido presently serves as a medical office officer in the FDA in the Division of Neuromodulation and Rehabilitation Devices, the Office of Evaluation and Quality. Dr. Sal is a man of humble beginnings. He heard the call to service when he was in high school and left to fight in Vietnam as a Green Beret with the US Special Forces. His gifted leadership and keen intelligence was noted by the US Army, and they made sure he went back to high school, but not just that. He graduated with honors. He then was in the inaugural cohort of the first US Army PA class in 1977 at Baylor College of Medicine. But that wasn't enough for this innovative man. After serving for several years as a PA, he went back to school, as you will see he does throughout his life. Became a physician, did a residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation, went on to become the chairman of the University of Kentucky, got recruited to University of Pennsylvania, and while there, he garnered more than four million dollars in NIH funding and wrote more than 170 publications. As a physician leader, he pivoted and played a leading role in the conception, development, and implementation of a large hospital merger with Good Shepherd Hospital and University of Pennsylvania. He serves the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Advisor Advisory Commission on Special Disabilities, as well as the U.S. Part Department of Defense Health Policy Board. Although he did go on to get a degree in MD and a doctorate of education at University of Pennsylvania, he never forgot his roots as a physician assistant. I met Dr. Sal in 2017, 2016, 2016 at Dominican University and I would not be the person I am today without his mentorship. It is my greatest honor to introduce to you tonight one of the greats and continued exemplary examples of lifelong learning, the chairman of our board and highly esteemed motivational force in medicine, Dr. Richard Salcido. Thank, thank you very much, Mary. I, I appreciate the, the kind words. Uh, just a couple of disclaimers. Uh, because of my job, I have to say that um, uh, what I have to say today is not reflective of any policies or procedures having to do with the federal government or the Food and Drug Administration um, or the United States Army uh, or um, anyone else. So these are my own comments that I'm going to make today based on my experience. And I know that the students have had a lot of advice. So what, what I'm not going to do is uh, tax, tax the reserve by talking about 
about um, medical subjects because they're well aware of them and they're right in, right in, the, uh, in the middle of learning all that. But what I'm going to try to do is give some words of uh, wisdom, uh, some uh, truths, axioms, and also um, just some principles uh, to guide them through the next phase of their career. Okay, now I need to move this up. Yeah. Here, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, thank, thank you very much, and sorry, sorry for the delay. Uh, so, so what I'm gonna do is uh, take you all through a journey um, that talks about why I'm here, how I got here, and uh, it's reminiscent of one time there was a Admiral Stock, Stockdale, uh, a Navy Admiral was running for Vice President. Uh, really, no one heard of him. He shows up on the stage to, for the debate, and he says, uh, who am I and why am I here? That didn't go over very well. So I want to say the same thing. Uh, who am I and what brought me here? Well, uh, it, it, I uh, subscribe to um, a lot of uh, principles that I think help me in my career and I want to pass those on. Um, I believe in dynamic inclusion led by an example of hard work. And um, I think one of the best compliments I've ever had, two of them, one was I was walking down the hall in the hospital and there were two resident physicians in front of me. You know, they had sort of a sixth sense, they knew I was behind them. And I heard one of them whisper to the other one with my supersonic ears, uh-oh, here comes work. And so they were right. And uh, the other person uh, that uh, brought that to mind recently uh, is Mary. Um, my wife said, Mary is the, the only person that she's ever met that works harder than I do. So I, I think we're, we're blessed to have Mary as your, as your leader, your friend, and sometimes uh, your parent. So I, I think uh, what, what I what, what thought about during my career is how to bring added value to everything that I do. And that didn't happen instantaneously. I had to think about it a lot. And some people say my, my, uh, my bio is too long. Uh, well, what can you expect at, at, at being 30 years old? So, but I think my next one will be a lot shorter. It'll be he published but still perished. Uh, but in any case, um, we're gonna talk about learning across the lifespan. And my, my professional ambitions developed as we went uh, along. When I say we, my wife and I, I met my wife in PA school. Um, and uh, leadership, education, research, enterprise. Uh, as the Catholic nuns say, you, you, you can't have a mission without money. So you have to have money to run an enterprise like this to teach students. And so that's important. And you have to, ha I have an insatiable curiosity. I'm always asking questions. Uh, in fact, I met a gentleman who unfortunately had a stroke and uh, he said the only thing he could remember about me is I ask a lot of questions. So uh, I, I think I got through to him somehow, uh, uh, bless him. Um, and, and so also you have to have a, an ability to translate vision into action. You know, there are a lot of people that, that are dreamers, but you gotta get up front there and start translating some of your thoughts into action. You have to be a pace setter. If you're going, you know, either, as they say in the Marine Corps, either lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. Uh, and so you can't have anybody in between uh, meddling in things. Um, and be sure that you're on the leading edge of interprofessional collaboration. You can't do this alone. And I'll talk a little bit about what's gonna happen when you get to the hospital. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about where I came from and how I developed this insatiable uh, curiosity. Uh, so what does this picture have to do with anything? Well, that's a valley in the desert, in a godforsaken place called Darwin, California. Population, 
50. It's a mining town. It's, it was owned by the Andacopper uh, Mining Company. My father was a miner there. So you might think, well, why would you want to live in a place like that? Well, they needed somebody to take the copper out of the ground. And it was a little bit after the war started, World War II, and uh, so my father also worked in a, in a vanadium and a tungsten mine further north in California. And not many people know that there are a lot of mines in California, a lot of, lot, lot of uh, uh, minerals. Um, uh, vanadium is used to uh, harden turbines in, in, jet, in air, jet, airplane uh, jet engines. So I knew a little bit about the periodic table before I even uh, went to high school. And uh, so, you know, someone can come from a place like that. I developed my curiosity because if you look at the town down in the valley, over to the right of it is to the east. And if you keep going, uh, then that's Las Vegas, Nevada. And why was my curiosity so, so, so um, well-developed? Well, in the next slide, I can show you why. <clears throat> That's an atomic bomb. And uh, Nevada is the, is the uh, testing range. And when I, was a, when I was in my early formative years, I heard these bombs go off all the time. And we were afraid that the world was going to come to an end. And um, sure enough, I, I'm weaving this uh, because um, some of the issues that I thought about when I was uh, in my early formative years are still in play right now. And, uh, you know, people ask me where I'm from all the time. Well, I'm from California. And I had a department chairman that I worked with for, for many, many years, and he always introduced me as someone from Los Angeles. Well, that's not Los Angeles. That's out in the high desert in California. And uh, that was, our, that was our, our house. We didn't own that house. It belonged to the mine. My father worked hard, so they gave him a place to live. And then to the left, you can see an old gas pump. And I'm old enough to know how that thing worked. They used to pump up the gas, and then a siphon would put it into your car. And to the left, you see a post office. And I remember my first interaction with a post office. I think I was about maybe six years old, and I ordered a multicolored pencil. It cost a nickel, and I waited every day for that pencil to come. And that was before Amazon. And, it's, and so, so my, I would just worry my mother to death wanting to know about that pencil. So recently, my daughter, my daughter who's in her 40s, uh, bought me a pencil, a multicolored pencil. But anyway, you can see, um, you can see the, the, the environment that I grew up in, but it didn't limit me. I had this, cur this burning curiosity about what was on the other side of the mountain all the time. And then, uh, then let's talk a little bit about the environment. How does this weave into what I'm talking about? What do I know about the environment? Well, I'm from California. This is Lake Mono Lake here. Mono Lake, when, at, at its height, you couldn't see uh, these, the white rings around Mono Lake, and you couldn't see these rocks. So they uh, took all of our water from Northern California and siphoned it off into a big aqueduct into LA. Now they claim that there's enough water to go around for everybody, but it doesn't work that way. So it's a big environmental thing that's going on. And so I learned about that. The other thing I learned about, not too far from where I grew up, is this whole issue about diversity and inclusion we hear about all the time. Uh, you know, the people that are bylines, diversity and inclusion, it's an elevator speech, it's, it's a card on an elevator. But listen to this. Manzanar, manzanar is a Spanish word that means apple. In the apple field specifically. So this was a Japanese internment camp. And I'm old enough to remember when it was open. And uh, we used to go there and pick, pick apples and eat so many we got sick. Uh, but in any case, uh, in 1990, the United States decided to, um, uh, to apologize to the Japanese that were in the internment camp. 
And then this is a letter from George Bush. Uh, so, so basically, he's talking about justice, inclusion, diversity, and forgiveness, and, 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 and those sort of things. So why did that make such a big impression on me? Because it's not too far from where I show you where our house was. And then, in around 1954, uh, I was sitting in front of this house that you just saw, and I saw a green van roll up in front of my house. And it was the Border Patrol. And they took my father. Despite his uh, protesting that he was a World War II veteran, he was born in the United States. My grandfather was born in the United States, and I don't know that far back after that, or before that. And so they took him anyway, until he could prove that he was an American. Then they let him go. But that was terrifying for me, and I didn't realize how terrifying that was until maybe 30 years later, I was driving, minding my own business uh, in California, across the border into California, and I saw those green vans again. I hadn't thought about them or seen them and it was terrifying. And so you can see how those impressions of the way people treat each other uh, are made on, on young people. And it reminds me of all the stuff that's going on down at, at the border, the Mexican-American border, which is dropped out of the news cycles. So this, this was a policy and a procedure that, that was implemented by um, President Eisenhower, was, who was a, 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 a five-star general in World War II, was from Texas. And what they decided to do in his administration is take all of those people that were mining, mining the fences and mining, uh, mining and, and every other work that you can think of they could do and deport them. They didn't need them anymore. And along with that, they deported 150,000 American citizens and a lot of them were World War II veterans. Now there's a parallelism. It's, this stuff is still going on. And so I thought, well, you know, I, I need, to, I need to, uh, to do something. I need to get a job. I need to be something. I didn't know what I wanted to be. So I got a job working in a, in a pear orchard, picking pears. We got paid 25 cents a box. And then all the bullies stole all the pears, put them in their boxes. So at the end of the day, ended up with a, about 75 cents and, um, and some uh, rice and beans, which was, which was the best part of it was the rice and beans. But there was no unity, there, there was no collaboration, there was no teamwork. And so I decided, well, I think I better try to figure something else out. So I decided to join the United States Army. Uh, and I made it through all the exams and everything like that and got in. But uh, this is a bit of irony, this, this slide I'm going to show you now. This is called an Honest John Rocket. No doubt named after um, uh, Mary's husband. His name is Jonathan. So it's Honest John Rocket. Uh, it's, the metaphor is, you know, Honest John. Then there's Little John. There's a smaller rocket. But it's ironic that... I went into a, a pretty rigorous uh, area in, in the military, and it had to do with uh, nuclear weapons, of which I became familiar with as a child from the Nevada test range. Now, this is an oxymoron. I'm going to tell you why it's an oxymoron. This is supposed to be a tactical nuclear weapon. A tac that's an oxymoron. Tactical nuclear weapons don't exist because of their massive destruction. This would wipe out a whole town, small town, 50,000 people. So I, I, I did that for a long time. So I was a nuclear weapons specialist. And then Vietnam started and I thought, well, uh, I, I better learn how to take care of myself if, if I get sent to Vietnam. So I thought, well, what better way than to be in the best unit in the United States Army? And so here you go. So this is a uh, Mac Beard condo in November 1968. I was in Vietnam, and I'm in the second line up, the third person to the right. Uh, you see, I'm a little bit taller than the, than the people on, on, on my right there. Just a joke, because they always put everybody the tallest to the shortest. 
and I guess I was third of the shortest there. Uh, but I was built like a fire hydrant, so that helped. Um, but, any, but anyway, so what is, what is Special Forces? Why am I telling you about this? Uh, well, our job, uh, you know, the, there are no Rambos there, but there were a lot of people, there were a lot of heroes there. And I regret to this day that I didn't get to know their stories. I've read about their stories online. So I'm a bit of an ethnographer. Uh, I would like to learn about people, where they come from. For example, the students. I know that uh, a student, Ag Aguilar, uh, wanted to be, I think she wanted to be uh, an air traffic controller if she didn't get into, uh, into PA school. Um, so I know a little bit about some of the students that we interviewed. So why am I telling you this? Well, not everybody in that organization was a Rambo, but there were some very highly decorated people. They were heroes, and I'm happy that I'm still alive and I got the opportunity to walk amongst them. And so what is our job? What was our job? Our job is to train, organize, and equip an indigenous force. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's what's going on in our world right now, to help to help defend themselves. And our motto is the oppresso libre, which is a, is a Latin word that means liberate the oppressed. And the two cross, the two crossed uh, arrows are, are, are the, um, uh, the, the organization's um, uh, uh, emblems. And then, uh, uh, so I, uh, those, those uh, three bolts of lightning means that you have to want to do three things. First of all, you have to volunteer. Second thing is you have to volunteer to jump out of an airplane. And the third thing is you have to volunteer to go anywhere, anytime, any place. And so I was lucky that uh, I got tapped on the shoulder many times about going to do this and that. So I was trained in infantry operations and intelligence, strategic reconnaissance, heavy weapons, light and heavy weapons. And I was also fortunate to become a special forces medic among the rig most rigorous training that you can get. And so when all that was over, I thought, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And then they came out with the PA program. And I was lucky enough, it was a, it was a, a worldwide competition. I was lucky enough to get into that. I still don't know how I got into it, but I got into it. And, um, and so I know what you're going through. I've been through what you're going through. And I know it's hard. Right now, you're, you're probably overwhelmed. And I was too, but fortunately, I met a young lady who's been my wife for many decades, and uh, she helped me through. She was an ICU nurse, Mary Ann Salcedo. She's out here somewhere. I know she's going to be embarrassed. Uh, but uh, she, she helped me through all of this, the cardiology and so on and so forth. She was an ICU nurse. So we did it together as a team, and then I got stationed in Germany, and I got to do a lot of things in Germany that, lo and behold, history repeated itself again. So we were asked to do a uh, liberate the oppressed mission again. Guess where it was? Not in a faraway land. It was in California. So we went to California, and there's the newspapers right there, Salinas, California. Uh, it's it, it, it's, in, it, it's in, in a valley, and it's um, uh, very, very, very fertile, very rich, and there's always a lot of migrant farm workers working there, so on and so forth. So there's a big hullabaloo with the migrant farm workers and the company called Pick and Pack, kicked them out of their, their housing. And they, uh, there, was a lot, there was a lot of strife. And the governor got involved and the governor called the Department of Defense and they said, can we get some help? So they sent a 12-man Green Beret team. They didn't, women weren't in the Green Berets. I think there's a few in there now. Uh, so anyway, our job was to clean up this camp, Camp McKellen. As it turns out, a psychologist who probably need, needed to be evaluated himself decided that this camp, because it wasn't used for a concentration, uh, not a concentration camp, but a, uh, it, it was a, a camp for Japanese, internment camp, but it wasn't used anymore. And whatever reason, they decided that they were going to let... Uh, you know, vagrant, vagrant uh, children go in there with sledgehammers and bust up all the, bust up all the toilets and bust everything up to get their frustrations out. 
Well, one of our jobs is to go back in there and get that thing running again so they would have a place to live. And because I was a medic, I was in charge of making sure they had a medical clinic. And then there's, a, there's a, some of that in action. Well, right around the same time after we were there, uh, they, they were still having some, some problems. And Cesar Chavez, uh, who was a, an American in the United States Navy when World War II, um, uh, became, uh, he was an attorney and he became uh, the, the lead uh, fighter for, for migrant farm workers. So I'm a, these are some real world experiences I've had and I, I'm gonna challenge all of you to get some real world experiences. I know one of your faculty members wants to go to Guatemala. They have good Mexican food in Guatemala. Um, but in any case, I've been in the Vietnam and the Central Highlands we organized, trained, and equipped Montagnards, which is a French word for mountain, mountain men. They're the indigenous population, Chinese, Cambodians, Laotians, and Vietnamese. And in Germany, I was there twice, and one of my jobs was a medical officer, and I got to go up and down the Czechoslovakian border before uh, the Berlin Wall came down, and we could see the, uh, the communists with their dogs and so on and so forth there. So that was a good experience. I also got to work with the Israeli army, one of the best trained armies in the world at that time. And in, in Mexico, I went to medical school there. I was a little old to be accepted into medical school. I was 38 when I went to medical school. So I got in, in the only medical school I applied to, I got in and the rest is history. Uh, in Guatemala, the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, and also in Ireland. I got to travel with my cohort from the University of Pennsylvania to study the, uh, uh, the uh, European Union education system. Now, what does that, all that mean to you? Well, if you have all these experiences, when you leave here, you'll be able to explore some of your ideas, act on them. So, but expect organizational nuances. Organizations don't love you back. So you're gonna run into some roadblocks that you need to think about when you get out of your training and, and go into um, in your practice. So anticipate, because they'll be there. You have to wait, you can't wait for them. You have to know they're coming. Organizational nuances is what I call them. You're gonna have to be onboarded into your new hospital. You're gonna have to be credentialed into your new hospital. People will have to attest that you're a good person all over again. And then you need to know your place in the organization. Your physician assistant, you're gonna be working with a collaborating physician you need to know that person's circle of influence in the hospital, and you need to know what yours is. Um, and then uh, dig deep for pearls. That's just a, a, a metaphor in medicine. You know, you, you have to dive deep to learn things. Um, and then be an active listener. It's so hard to be an active listener because you're always smart people uh, like you all or any smart people are listening to somebody and before they're finished even processing what they're saying, they've already got an answer ready. And so think about that, active listening. When you walk into the hospital, listen more than you talk. Refrain from non-productive communications, what's that, what that, that means. Uh, you know, don't be a room mortologist. You weren't trained to be a room mortologist somebody who specializes in rumors. Okay, so we had to train the physicians, the residents at, okay? Uh, and refrain from non-productive communications. Now, the other pearl, I sort of gave you half of the pearl earlier, is respect the people in the hospital or wherever you go, try to find out about them, be an ethnographer. Don't, don't interrogate them like I do. Uh, I want to know everything about everybody. You know, I, I'm the kind of person who asked the waitress uh, where she went to school, what her plans are, and all that stuff, and my kids were rolling their eyes. But in any case, ask your, your supervisors, your supervising physician, a collaborating physician, where they came from, how they got there, what their aspirations are, how you can work with them, so, and you can learn a lot about them. And, and you know, you j just, just uh, for example, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that uh, Marcy was at the University of Washington or was it Washington University? Washu. Okay, Washu, okay. All right. 
So is it 10 patients at 9 o'clock or 9 patients at 10 o'clock? You're supposed to laugh now. <laughs> right. So that's going to happen to you all the time. So I'm going to just give you an example, a quick example. Dr. Lamerson worked in the same hospital I did at the University of Pennsylvania. I saw him walking down the hall every time I went over where the hyperbaric chamber was. Said hello to him. That was about it. I never stopped him and asked him, tell me about the hyperbaric chamber. How did you get here? What are you doing? Well, when he died, I found out. Uh, this is a 1996 uh, photo. He was uh, retroactively awarded the Green Beret Special Forces tab in the U.S. Army School uh, a diver badge. You know why? Because he invented the scuba gear. And the way he did it, he was in New Jersey, working at the New Jersey Shore, and he was a painter. He used to work with his father. And when he, while he was painting, he was trying to figure out how he could stop from breathing all those fumes. So he invented a rebreather. How about that? And so he became a physician, and, uh, and he worked uh, with the OSS, which is the, uh, the Organization of Strategic Services, uh, and they did a lot of spy missions in, uh, in, in Japan. And uh, he also um, had, a, had a, he was a physician, so he, so he was in the medical corps, and he served in Ceylon and Burma. So what's so special about Burma? Well, the entire unit of the University of Pennsylvania was called to action in Burma during World War II. They would just come in like they would come to North Central and say, okay, you guys are going to wherever. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's important to know about people know about your colleagues. I know a lot about you because I read all your bios, every, each and every one of them, of the people that applied when I read them. Uh, and so uh, that's a little, that's a little uh, um, caveat about pearls. So you have to ask a lot of questions. A question is an opportunity for you to have discussions with people. Uh, it, it's, a conversation is a rare phenomenon, uh, even for S Socrates. It's not confrontational. You sit down with somebody, you don't need to have a confrontational discussion with them all the time. It's not a debate, it's not an exam because you're all geared up to take the exams. Um, but, but in any case, it, it, it may, may lead to some dialogue. Excuse me, I just have to. I'm gonna give you an assignment. Why don't you read this while I'm uh, getting rid of this dry throat here. So. Conversation is a game with some hard rules. Say only what you mean, say it accurately as you can, and listen and respect what the other person says. However, uh, however uh, different or difficult it is, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see the rest of it, but, but anyway, um, however difficult it is, um, then, uh, you should be able to, to be willing to correct yourself, defend yourself and correct yourself. There's nothing better in a conversation, hopefully, and then you can say, okay, well, I, I was wrong. Tell me, tell me how you feel about this. Tell me how you feel about this. And it can't be a platitude. It has to uh, come naturally because people will tell you. And you're gonna have conflicts. You're gonna walk in the, up in the ward and say, I'd like for this patient to be on potassium. And the nurse might say, uh, says who? And then you might say, help me understand why, why you're asking me that. Of course, my collaborating physician and I decided that the person needed to be on potassium. And by the way, here's why. So that's what that's supposed to tell you about. So uh, always ask questions. Um, so, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, be attentive, and be intelligent, be reasonable, be loving, and if necessary, change your course. People will take advantage of you, by the way. They'll take advantage of you. You'll see as weak. I filled out a survey one time, and I found out that uh, I, I gave up too easily. Here's another phenomenon that's, that's uh, it's, it's a German word that means, uh, uh, that means um, you know, having um, glee in someone else's misfortune. You know, I'm not gonna read this whole slide, 
but it's, it's a poorly un uh, uh, understood uh, phenomenon. Uh, it's a complex emotion. Uh, it can provide a window into the darker side of humanity. So I'll just give you a quick example, and you know it well because you drive up and down these highways. You see a person get out of the lane and get in the, in the far right lane that's not a lane, and you say to yourself, well, I hope that person gets a ticket. Or if you're coming from the dark side, you might say, I hope that person crashes into something. We all do that, and you do that in the hospital, and you do that in your class. And that's why I think we're blessed to have Mary here because uh, she has a relationship-based uh, 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 program. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, powerful, emotive uh, situation in terms of, uh, I like Venn diagrams, uh, the epistemology of diversity and inclusion, uh, the truths, that's what the, the truthisms are, and then your knowledge and your beliefs. You don't have to convince anybody of anything if they believe it already, no matter whether they're wrong or right. So you have to help them with the truths, and you also have to be able to negotiate with them as well. You have to have a vision uh, it, when, you, when you're on board. Um, nurture creativity at all levels. It's your job. You know, they got rid of middle managers in this country. And uh, I don't know if this is the right metaphor. I'll take responsibility for it. Uh, you're going to be middle managers. You're going to be the glue between your collaborating physician, yourself, and the patient. The patient always comes first. I'm going to skip over this. Is, uh, this is all uh, principles uh, that just basically uh, underlies everything that I said. Um, this was my thesis when I got my doctoral degree about uh, having uh, policy levers. Remember I said you have policies and procedures? Well, a policy can be a lever to get somebody to do something they don't want to do. Uh, and uh, in the medical education space, and this is what I studied for my dissertation and my thesis, they now have policy levers. And what I found out is the middle managers are the hardest nut to crack. The upper echelons of administration, they get it because their job depends on it. And the lower people, I shouldn't say the lower, the more junior people, uh, they get it because that's how they were brought up. Every one of the people sitting in this chair will defend uh, uh, someone to the nth degree if they're being taken advantage of or they're being called names. So in the PA space, they haven't figured that out yet. There's no, the, the, although they have aspirations that they want to have diversity and inclusion, but they haven't done anything about it in their, there are no policy levers. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I just get to tell you a quick story about these two students here. That's me with my obligatory cup of coffee. Uh, and by the way, don't wear scrub greens when you go downtown to have a hamburger. That reflects poorly on North Central uh, and on you. But in any case, the girl on the right uh, is a Mexican-American girl. Her mother worked in a cafeteria of a pretty high-level uh, 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 school. And she worked and worked and worked, and the school let her send her daughter there for free. Otherwise, they would have never been able to go to that school. Um, so she, her aspiration was to go to medical school. She got into medical school, but here's where culture comes in. She didn't want to go because she didn't want to leave her mother. That reminds me, i got to catch up with her again. And then the person on the left is a PhD student. Um, then we talk about silos. You all know what silos are here in the Midwest. Um, you know, uh, our job is to drive an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary stake through those silos so we can communicate with each other. Community partnerships. Uh, and this is a quote, I quoted myself here, um, inclusion. The current events around the globe have vividly demonstrated that the, the human need to be included is a very powerful and motive force. That was written in 2011, and it's apropos today. And so I hope I gave you some pearls. 
some wisdom, some, some things to think about. Uh, I'm sorry about having a dry throat. Um, but in any case, uh, I appreciate you all being here and I appreciate the parents being here. Uh, you bring great credit upon yourselves, uh, North Central College, uh, the PA profession, uh, in the highest traditions of, of uh, health care. So thank you. We will now proceed with the presentation of the white coats. Dr. Delane's mentee group may now stand. Jasmine Garcia. <laughs> Molly Hartig. Paige Smith. <laughs> Paige Snyder. Kansavan Van Pakti. Dr. Egerton's mentee group may now rise. <laughs> Jennifer Phil. Antonia Guspodnova.
Madison Kopjo. Dr. Garg's mentee group may now rise. Alicia Aguilar. Kimberly Russell. Dr. Grohl's mentee group may now rise. Tracy Ho. Lauren Percher. Aaron Seeley. Dr. Luttrell's mentee group may now rise. Christopher Foster. Katie Shipley.
Jessica Wold. Ms. Martin's mentee group may now rise. Alexa Childs. Kelly Tarr. Dr. Mearsman's mentee group may now rise. Maria Agoris. Tiffany Snow. Miss Sonicson's mentee group may now rise. <laughs> Caroline Klein Dillon. Mia Jellovac. Dr. Store Burning's mentee group may now rise. Lauren Glazer.
Megan Orzek. Catlin Paul. Tarun Sharma. Ashley Truhlar. Dr. Woods Mentee Group may now rise. <laughs> Megan Davis. Bryce Dunlap. <laughs> Jared Fielding. Andrea Guzman. <laughs> Alexandria Reinstein. The class of 2023 may now stand to recite the PA oath. Please repeat after me. I pledge to perform the following duties. 
with honesty and dedication. I will hold my primary responsibility, the health, safety, welfare, and dignity of all human beings. I will uphold the tenets of patient autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. I will recognize and promote the value of diversity. I will treat equally all persons who seek my care. I will hold in confidence the information shared in the course of practicing medicine. I will assess my personal capabilities and limitations. Striving always to improve my medical practice. I will actively seek to expand my knowledge and skills. Keeping abreast of the advances in medicine. I will work with other members of the healthcare team. to provide compassionate and effective care of patients. I will use my knowledge and experience to contribute to an improved community. I will respect my professional relationship with the physician. I will share and expand knowledge within the profession. These duties are pledged with sincerity and upon my honor. The PA class of 2023 may now sit. Please join me now for a time of meditation to reflect on the promises just made.
The PA class of 2023 may now stand. I would like to invite you all now to join me in a further round of applause for the class of 2023.